conservation biology. So there's really uh, like two branches of conservation biology. There are, I'm not going to tell you that, there, that these people don't exist, but there are people out there that are in conservation biology because it's touchy-feely and they're like, oh, we got to save the whales or save the, you know, pygmy rattlesnakes or whatever, right? They pick a, you know, one type of organism and, and that's why they're doing this. That's why they got into this. They want to save just one uh, individual. But as a whole, that's not what conservation biology is all about. This field of biology is um, focused on preventing extinction and encouraging biodiversity, right? So, biologists that focus on preventing extinction. and uh, maintaining biodiversity. Um, and really, the key to this, the key that, that uh, most conservation biologists are about is reducing human impact on the rest of the world, right? So that's what we want to aim to do. <laughs> Again, um, there are some people out there that, that are conservation biologists that um, want to completely keep humans out of, of these resources, that the humans are the enemy, and, and uh, so you know, they want to make sure that these resources are untouched and these ecosystems are untouched and that we don't mess with them at all. But the vast majority of conservation biologists are not about that. The vast majority of conservation biologists are like, hey, how can we as humans do what we need to do and what we want to do to develop and to survive and all these things while not completely destroying everything in our path, because when it comes down to it, it's probably better that we don't do that. It's probably better that we don't destroy everything in our path, uh, in our path because we know that um, things like maintaining biodiversity is going to benefit us uh, because a uh, more biodiverse ecosystem is going to be one that is more stable, and more stable ecosystems are, in general, better for us, right? So um, there are lots of reasons why species may become endangered, right? But we're going to hit a few of them. Uh, number one. The number one reason the species become endangered is what? Anybody know? Habitat loss, exactly. Okay, so it turns out that there are certain types of land that humans like and certain types of land that we dislike. Those types of land that we dislike are ones that um, are not good for growing crops or that cause us to die from disease, right? So that means that forests and swamps are bad. We don't like them. We much rather prefer grasslands and plains, right? So uh, humans transform forests and swamps into land types that are more useful for us. Our hometown here, Tampa Bay, is a perfect example of this. Tampa used to be a big old swamp, but if it was still a big old swamp, not only could not nearly as many people live here, but we would all die of various diseases that are uh, uh, related to living in the swamp. Uh, malaria probably would be would be a big a big hit for us. Okay, um, so this is something that we're not going to stop doing, right? A conservation biologist is not going to be like, oh no. You can't take that area and irrigate it to make it into land. You, that's a swamp. We need it to be a swamp, 
right? So what they do is they try to mitigate it a little bit. They try to say, hey, uh, what's one way that we can allow for there to still be these species around, but we can drain some of it, okay? And uh, again, it's, it's a compromise, and we say that these areas are called conservation areas. And these conservation areas are basically places that we are not going to change, and it allows those native species to find someplace else to live to relocate. Okay, so conservation areas allow native species to relocate. Is this a perfect um, solution to this problem? No. But is it a solution that mitigates human impact? Yes. Okay. All right. Habitat partitioning. Even if we don't take the entire land type away, um, we often need to at least get through it, right? So if you've ever driven across the state of Florida, um, over uh, uh, gone through um, I-75 there on, the, on Alligator Alley, basically when you look either to your left or your right, there's nothing. There's just swamp on both sides of you for a long time, right? Now, that's undeveloped land that we really haven't touched, but we built um, a pretty big freeway through the middle of it. So then, like, does, is that bad? Does it hurt things? Certainly, because um, things that were on one side of it are now separated from stuff on the other side. And if there happens to be something important, some important resource that's on the other side of I-75, it's unlikely that an organism is going to be able to get across I-75 or do that on a daily basis to the point where it's not going to affect the overall ecosystem. Okay, so this uh, resource partitioning is when an ecosystem gets divided up um, by some human interaction, things like um, roads, uh, power lines, um, um, I don't know, lots of stuff, trains, any of those things. So when an ecosystem is divided, By a road, railroad, pipeline, power lines, etc. Right? Anything that we really need to clear cut for and then um, divide up. Uh, if you ever noticed on Alligator Alley, there are um, some, some ways that we try to mitigate this, right? Every once in a while, you'll drive over a little bridge, and that little bridge has um, a big passage underneath it that's supposed to allow for um, wildlife to go from one side to the other, um, and that's supposed to help a little bit. This is a way to mitigate it. We call these wildlife bridges. Say wildlife bridges allow species to move between the partitions. But again, this is not a perfect um, solution to this because uh, here's a really cool wildlife bridge, right? But ultimately, like an organism, in order to get from what was clearly a forest before, right? This whole thing was a forest. So you got a forest on the left side and a forest on the right side. They have to leave the forest and then go across this narrow passageway that has all these cars traveling under it. It's not exactly a comfortable situation for most animals to make this passageway across this. And they're not going to continually do it. Can they if they need to for some reason? Yes. But is it going to be ideal for them? No. Right? So this is you know, a way to mitigate things, like always. Right? That's what we're most concerned about with... Um, with conservation biology is, is making sure that uh, we're, we're lessening the impact in whatever way that we can, okay? Last thing are um, dams and irrigation. Okay, not only do dams reduce the flow of waterways, but um, also reduce the sediment concentration and the nutrient concentration, right? So 
Why do we dam rivers? We normally think about dams, we think about like hydroelectric power. Turns out that's really not what we use most dams for. Most dams are for irrigation, for splitting off a small portion of the waterway so that we can use it um, in watering fields or providing uh, a, a municipality with a water source, right? So any dam will reduce the flow of the waterway, which reduces nutrients downstream. And honestly, this is one of those things that we haven't found out a good way to irrigate or to uh, mitigate yet. We we don't know how you get around this. We still do it. We still take raging rivers and reduce them to you know tiny little creeks um, with all of the irrigation that we do. And we just we need the water. And so there's no great way to get around this. No no good way to uh, mitigate that problem. All right. Let's talk about the second reason that organisms become endangered. That's uh, Invasive species say any non native species that out competes native species is invasive. Okay, what does this term non-native even mean? Isn't from, that ecosystem? Isn't from that ecosystem. But aren't we all from different ecosystems if we go back far enough? And the answer to that is yes. And so what do we do in order to uh, be able to define non-native? We just assign an arbitrary number. It's like sometime in the 1600s, right? And they say if it was there in the 1600s, it's native. If it's not, it's not. Why did they pick that date? I guess there was a massive increase in trade around that time, and so we saw a lot of, uh, of uh, species changing uh, where, they, where their habitats were. But um, that's the point. That's the cutoff. If it was there in the 1600s, it's native. If it's not, it's not. It's arbitrary. All right. Uh, so how do these things get introduced? Most of them are introduced by accident. Okay, we don't we don't mean any harm from this, um, but it turns out that we've got like you know shipping and global trade, even travel. Right, that's why when you go to a different country, you go through customs and they say, hey, do you have any fruit with you? Right, and depending on where you're you're going into, what part of the uh, or what country you're going into. You might be able to take fruit with you and you might not. And the reason for that is that you might bring in a disease. They're not worried about you growing some unique fruit here that's never been grown before. They're worried about where did it come from? Does it have a disease? Is this disease something that could be transferred to our crops in our country? And would that cause a problem? Okay. Um, shipping containers often contain, you know, stowaways that are there, you know, uh, insects that have gotten onto a crop or into a box or something like that that can then colonize uh, wherever they end up. And that's all just a, a um, part of global trade that's, you know, hard to get around, okay? Um, one of the things that's become an increasingly large problem in um, uh, aquatic ecosystems is the actual shipping container ships, right? Okay, and you don't need to draw this, but you might be interested. Uh, so just for visual, here's a container ship. It's got containers on it or something, right? It's stacked up, okay? This container ship, when it is up like this in the port, right, it is in danger of tipping over. If it were to go into rough seas, it would tip over, right? So when it goes into um, the ocean, right, they uh, make it so that it, it's not as high up. Right? But it can't go into the port like this because then it's, not, it's, it's drawing too much water. It's not shallow enough to get into the actual port. So it has to be able to adjust how buoyant it is. And the way that it adjusts how buoyant it is is that there are holes in the bottom of this ship like this. 
that are attached to pumps, and these are ballast yeah. containers, right? And so inside the ship, there's all of these different ballast containers, and they, uh, when they leave port, they allow water to come into these holes, like this, and that fills, oops, that fills up the ballast containers with water, and that causes the ship to sink further because it's heavier. What's up? Is that why, like, on a cruise, the holes are so wide? Uh, it's, well, one of the reasons also because fresh water is, like, super uh, um, valuable resource when you're, like, out at sea, and so they don't want to, like, fill the pool with fresh water, but they do refill the pool with salt water as it comes in, like, as water evaporates away, because it's going to evaporate pretty pretty fast, and so they always refill it with salt water because the fresh water is too uh, valuable when you're out at sea. It takes like the desalination on the on the ship is not efficient enough to be able to refill the pool. But um, it, certainly, it does increase the the ballast weight of it. Um, but in this case, these are just like tanks that are underneath underneath the ship. They're in the bow uh, of the ship. Um, and um, so they fill up, and then when they have to go to port, so they, they fill up and they, they travel across the ocean, and then when they go into port, they've got to um, come back up. So what do they do? They drain them, right? They've got pumps that drain out all this water. Well, where would that water come from? Wherever the, wherever the ship came from. So if you have a giant ship that came from Hong Kong or Tokyo Bay or something like that, right? Tokyo Bay, water goes in, and then it comes into Tampa Bay, and then it gets all the water out, which is all from Tokyo Bay, and contains whatever stuff was in Tokyo Bay. And these things, these uh, uh, ballast ports, are not small. They're like this big. And so anything that can fit through a hole this big can be in the ballast containers, right? So we can end up with invasives here in Tampa that come from Tokyo Bay, which is a very different ecosystem uh, because of these container ships. Now, there's regulations on this. And the regulations say it's something like every 200 miles, they're supposed to uh, refresh 50% of the ballast in their tanks, right? So 200 miles, they're supposed to slow down. They're supposed to empty some of their ballast and re uh, uh, take in their ballast. And that means that, like, um, the most that they're going to be displacing the species is, like, 200 miles, which is not a terrible amount. Uh, but the problem is that costs money. And it costs time to do that. And so um, all that there is is a little captain's log that says, yeah, we totally did that. Uh, and they just sign off on the captain's log. And so even though these uh, regulations are there, they're not necessarily being followed um, super strictly. And uh, so it leads to invasives showing up in, um, in waterways. Um, what else? Introduction by accident. Sometimes the pet trade. Uh, causes introduction by accident. Uh, you guys heard about... Um, let me go to the next picture. I got it up to this. So here is here's a picture of a Burmese python eating an alligator in the Everglades. Right? Uh, here's a picture of a Burmese python who bit off more than he could chew and the alligator exploded out of him. So this is the python and the alligator exploded out of him because he ate it at one that was too big, right? But uh, the point is, Burmese pythons are from Burma, not from Tampa or from the Everglades, right? These are invasive species. And the question becomes, how did this invasive species, the Burmese python, get into the Everglades? Yeah. Like people exactly. A Burmese python gets huge, and so you buy them when they're this big at the pet store, right? And then you keep feeding them, and you're like, "Oh, cool! Now it eats, you know, little mice. Oh, cool! Now it eats rats. Oh man, now it eats bunnies." And then like you got to keep feeding it more and more and more until you're like, "What am I gonna do with this thing?" And so then you just set it free. Well, that used to be the party line. Turns out, that's not where the Burmese pythons and the Everglades came from. Uh, and we just found this out in like 2011, uh, so like six years ago now. But um, turns out there was a guy in Homestead, Florida, right, who um, was the number one supplier of Burmese pythons to the United States, right? He, uh, he owned a, a pet uh, trade business and he had a license to breed Burmese pythons. Right? And he had a giant warehouse 
in Homestead, Florida, and Hurricane Andrew came through and destroyed his entire warehouse and sent all of the small Burmese pythons and juvenile Burmese pythons that were in his warehouse all into the surrounding areas, right? And then he kind of sort of just didn't tell anybody about it. He was like, well, that, that was rough on my warehouse. And he never reported it. Well, I say never. He reported it in 2011, right? So we were coming out and saying, like, man, we got this massive invasive species problem in, in, uh, uh, in the Everglades with Burmese pythons. And there was all these stories that were coming around around that time. He was like, yeah, that might have been me. I lost, like, 100,000 Burmese pythons oh in 1992 to Hurricane Andrew. Uh, nothing. There's, it's not against the law. He had a, he had a license to breed them, right? And it was an accident, you know, Hurricane Andrew, you can't stop it. Uh, but it turns out that that was not necessarily related to like one pet owner here and there releasing their pet, but a bunch of them being released at the same time. So I would classify that as an accident, right? That's, that's a whoopsie. Um, yeah. Oh, it's pretty bad. Yeah, they are They are definitely, because they're an apex predator, they don't have any natural predators. They actually are the apex predator. Once they get past juvenile age, they, they feed on the alligators, not vice versa. Um, yeah, they're, they're, they're massive, like 20 feet. Um, anything? Rodents, big cat, oh yeah. Uh, no, they're they're always an apex predator. Yeah, I mean like. Yeah, they're trying unsuccessfully, but the the way that they figured out that um, just capture. Um, the way that they figured out that there was probably something going on um, in in two thousand and nine two thousand ten was they were doing DNA samples of these things, and um, the DNA from like all of them was almost identical saying that they were like from the exact same family tree because they were all bred by this exact same guy in Homestead, Florida. Oops. Not identical, but just from the exact same family tree. So they're like inbreeding and, and yeah. All right. So sometimes by accident, sometimes we do it on purpose. Okay, so um, sometimes for utility purposes. Um, and uh, so a really good example of this is Japanese kudzu. I think we talked about kudzu in here already. Did we talk about kudzu? Yeah. Um, so when we did railways, when we built the railroads, uh, we had railroad banks where we built up the land to, to put the railroad on top of. Uh, and then we didn't want them to erode away. And so we needed a really fast growing crop that had a really strong root structure. And so we used Japanese kudzu and we planted it along the railroad banks and it did exactly what it was supposed to. But then instead of just stopping growing at the railroad banks, it just grew all over the place. And um, kudzu is a vine and it grows up and over trees and makes a giant um, shade over the canopy of the tree that kills it. If you want to see some kudzu, you can walk down Sterling here uh, and go to yeah, Sterling there. Uh, and go to Corona Park, and all of the trees that are around Corona Park are covered in kudzu. You can see the vine wrapping up around them and, and, uh, and killing them off, and, and um, so the city has to come in and actually tear down the kudzu, but it's a losing battle. You can't tear it all down. You'll never get rid of it all, all of it because uh, it's invasive and it doesn't really have any natural predators. Georgia has some serious problems with kudzu. When you drive through Georgia, you look out in the forest, right, and basically all you see is um, kudzu. Right, it's covering over all the trees. Yeah. Can you like genetically modify it, like in the DNA? The kudzu? Yeah, like Maybe. The thing that's happening right now in Georgia is there's a specific bug that we, we're calling the kudzu bug now uh, that eats it and um, acts as a pest. And so, uh, as you can imagine, the, the, the um, carrying capacity of this bug has gone through the roof because it does eat the kudzu. Um, before it was called the kudzu bug, we used to call it the stink bug. Uh, and so it's this disgusting little bug that goes around and it eats kudzu. And so now in Georgia, it's like the most common insect uh, because there's so much kudzu and therefore there's so much kudzu bug, stink bug. Uh, yeah, so, so that again, you know, didn't work out as, as we had planned. 
Um, sometimes they're crops. Okay, so canola is a good example of that. Canola is a yellow flower, um, and we take its seeds and we grind them up and we make oil, canola oil with it, right? And it's really efficient and um, a great way to make oils, uh, but it's uh, non-native, and so it can um, escape from the, from the farm. Also, um, the, the canola we use is GMO. It's uh, genetically modified to... Uh, grow even faster than it normally does in its native environment. And so uh, when that does get off of the farms, it can reproduce pretty rapidly. Um, again, we might be like, oh, why don't you just make it so that you, you know, it, it genetically modify it so that it doesn't produce a seed. Well, like, we want the seed. That's what we're harvesting is the canola seed so we can get the oil from it. So we can't have it not make a seed, right? Uh, last one, my favorite one, is um, <coughs> stupidity. Um, Johnny Appleseed, everybody ever heard the story of Johnny Appleseed? Guy went across the United States and planted apple trees. Thanks a lot, jerk. That's uh, invasive now. Apple trees are invasive. Um, also, uh, there was this guy who really liked William Shakespeare, right? And so uh, he, one of the, the um, birds that's written a lot, about a lot in Shakespeare is the starling. And so he thought it would be really cool if um, there were starlings in the United States. And so he went around the United States and released starlings. And guess what? Now there's 200 million starlings in the United States, invasive species. Why? He liked William Shakespeare. That was the only reason. Uh, so people do dumb things. Uh, the starling is a good example of that. Uh, I think apple trees are from Europe. They weren't in the United States at all. Yeah. How about when, like, people uh, release a species like kill the invasive species? Yeah, that's, that's always fun when that happens. Uh, there's a really good Simpsons episode about that where they, like, um, there's this, this lizard, and the lizard is, like, uh, eating um, the eggs of birds and then laying its own eggs, and it's becoming a problem. And so then they, like, release these mongooses that kill the lizards. Or no, no, they release snakes that kill the lizards, and then there's a snake infestation. And so then they release mongooses to kill the, li the snakes, and then there's a mongoose infestation, and then they release bears to kill the mongooses. <laughs> and then everybody's just, like, hiding in their house from, from the bears. <laughs> Yeah, that never works out very well when we try to do that. They always just sort of take over. Did you ever try doing that with, uh, like, mosquitoes? And that's where Pika comes from? That's where what? Didn't they try to do that with mosquitoes with, like, Pika, where they genetically engineered the mosquitoes? Well, they engineered the, the mosquitoes, yeah, but that, they didn't, and actually I think that worked pretty well, but they didn't release another organism to kill off the mosquitoes. Like, Yeah, so, so they, there are these, there's this genetic uh, variation of, uh, the mosquito that, that carries West Nile and carries malaria and carries Zika. And um, basically, they reproduce as normal for a generation, and then the next generation is sterile, right? So um, they want to take these GMO um, mosquitoes and release them in certain areas that have high mosquito populations because it will obviously reduce the mosquito population significantly. Um, but there's all this pushback to it because, like, people don't want GMO mosquitoes released in their area. Like, it's going to cause some mutation that's going to make them the size of cats and then kill us or something like that. Um, but they tried to do it out in, uh, in West Palm Beach, and, like, it got struck down. Yeah, there was, like, all kinds of outrage and riots and stuff. Nah, that's, a, that's, a, that's false. The whole love bugs being uh, made by University of Florida or something like that. Love bugs are native. They've been around forever. Oh. <laughs> um, all right. So, uh, so that's, that's it for uh, invasive species. There's other reasons, though. <coughs> Overhunting, over exploitation. Okay, this one's pretty obvious, I think. If you remove a species at a greater rate than it reproduces, it will die. It will go extinct, right?
So if you're fishing, overfishing is when you remove the fish at a greater rate than they can reproduce, right? Overhunting, you kill the thing faster than it can reproduce. It's pretty obvious, right? Um, so what do we do in order to mitigate this? Hunting seasons, I heard that. Hunting seasons and limits. Say, okay, you can only hunt during these months and you can only capture two a day or three a day or something like that, right? Size. size limits, yeah. We want to make sure that they have had a chance to reproduce, that we don't want to get the babies. Um, uh, other things are important here. What's up? Yeah, zones that you can fish in that, that um, you know, are not known to be uh, areas for spawning, right? That's, that's another thing. Uh, in Florida, it's uh, uh, the, the hunting of alligators is very um, regulated, right? You, you can hunt alligators, but you have to go into a lottery, and then um, if you get one of the um, passes to hunt an alligator, you get you know, just one alligator, uh, and uh, you have to go out with a guide, right? Does anybody know why we do that? Why there's regulations on hunting alligators? Nope. Like alligator boots and fishes and all that, or like you use their skin? Nope. There's tons of alligators. The Florida alligator is like near overpopulation. Yes, yes, that is exactly the reason.